this morning we're going to continue in the book of Acts <clears throat> uh, that we've been journeying through now for some time, and we're only in chapter three. So, uh, but last week we talked uh, about the miraculous healing of the lame man from birth, and then we talked about the explanation of it. You know, this trial down in South Carolina, Jay mentioned, uh, it's got a lot of people tuned in. I mean, I'm telling you what, I mean, uh, Tammy has been listening to it. She, she just found out this week <laughs> that she could have been watching it on Samsung TV, and so, uh, so she's tuned in uh, all week long, and uh, it's funny because uh, so many people, especially here, <laughs> are wrapped up in that thing. But uh, last week we actually looked at that explanation of the miracle, again with the lame man, and, and Peter's report. Remember in the context of sort of a trial uh, or evidence, uh, we talked about uh, the five W's and the H, the who, the what, the why, the when, the where, and the how, sort of the evidence presented to the crowd. Now, having announced the crime to them, uh, presented the evidence to them and explained the nature of their sin, Peter then offered them pardon, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning, is the pardon that Peter offered him. There was an appeal of the preacher here. What a strange thing for the prosecuting attorney to become the defense attorney and the pardoning judge. And so Peter's burden was to encourage people to trust Christ, to repent of their sin, their sin be forgiven, and for them to experience a refreshing you know, we're living in a day that is difficult for doctrinal preachers because many are preaching everything but the doctrines. The truths and precepts of many are preaching everything but the truth and the precepts of the Bible. It may be what the people love hearing, but they'll never, be, listen, they will never be any depth of their, of their life. That which will help them in the crisis of life unless they understand the promises of God in His Word and stand on them in difficult seasons and times. And so that's what Peter is doing. He's going to tell them, you did it. Uh, you're the one who put him to death. We know Jesus laid down his life. But they were responsible in the actions of what transpired. And Peter's telling them, you did it. He explained that last week when he presented it. Now he's going to tell them how to get out of it. He's going to tell them to repent. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, because that's all I preach out of. <laughs> yes. I'd ask you to stand as we honor and read God's Word this morning. The inspired, holy, infallible Word of God. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 19 is where we're going to pick up. He says, Repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing, and there it is, times of refreshing come after repentance. And so uh, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. He's coming back one day. We're going to talk about that. Which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet with a capital P there. A prophet, he's speaking of Jesus, that shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, listen. Uh, yes, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those who follow as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are the you are the sons of the, you are sons of the prophets, and and of the covenant which God made with with our fathers, saying to Abraham, he's speaking to the Jewish crowd there. He's saying these promises are to you, and you rejected them. But just like the Lord, He's going to give you another opportunity when He comes again. And He's going to give you the opportunity to experience the promises. But one day, it's going to be too late if you reject Him. And so He goes on, He says, in, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up His servant, Jesus sent Him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. That is the blessing of forgiveness. And so would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. 
I pray now you'd move me out of the way. Lord, remind us that you've given us all an opportunity to know you. And Father, I pray if there's one here this morning that does not know you as Lord and Savior, this morning would be the morning that changes their eternal address. For we pray it in your precious name. Amen. You may be seated. So as we look at the appeal of the preacher, Peter there, uh, he's preaching. There's three things he speaks to. And the first one is repentance. Now repentance. He says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come for the presence of the Lord. Look, not only does Peter's sermon point people to Jesus and highlight the listener's sin, making it clear that people, the people of Jerusalem had something to repent of. But it also contains an appeal. You see, Peter was not interested in merely condemning his hearers. On the contrary, he wanted them to repent of their sins and to put their faith in Jesus. Now, repent. What does that mean? Uh, repent means a change of mind about themselves, their sin, and Jesus Christ. Uh, what causes somebody to truly repent? And repentance is literally turning away from what you're headed toward and turning toward something else. And in repentance, it is turning away from your sin and heading toward Jesus Christ. What causes someone to come to true repentance? I'm glad you asked. Here's three things that God uses to break through hard hearts and open spiritual eyes. The first thing God uses is His Word. That's what His Word does. Whether it's read or heard, uh, God breaks through the hard hearts and opens blind eyes. Referring to the gospel He wrote, John said in John 20, These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. That's what God's Word does. It exposes our sin because this is a holy Word and it is a living Word. And it will show us who we are, and it will also show us who God is, and we'll see that we're not the same. We'll see that God's holy. Matter of fact, He's three times holy. It'll show us we're wicked. Matter of fact, we must be three times wicked for a three times holy God to need to leave heaven, the throne room, and come to, heaven, to, heaven, to earth to save us through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so the Word of God will cause us and help us and show us our need for repentance. The second thing that God uses to bring about repentance is sorrow for sin. Now listen, let's be clear. To be sorry isn't enough. Sorrow alone is not repentance, but sorrow for sin can lead to true repentance. See, Judas had remorse for what he had done, but he never repented. He was sorry, but he did not repent. I once heard of someone use the example of a driver being pulled over for speeding. Hopefully that wasn't one of y'all. <laughs> the offer asks, are you sorry that you broke the law or are you sorry you got caught? That's the difference between sorrow and repentance. Uh, the third thing that God sometimes uses to bring about repentance is what we uh, talked about uh, several weeks back is the fear factor. The fear of judgment to come in the eternal hell, that's a legitimate reason for any rational unbeliever to consider repenting. There is an eternal hell. Luke 12 and verse 4 and 5 says, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him, God. There is a healthy fearness. Listen, God's fixed a day in which he'll judge the world in righteousness through a man, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. There is coming a day, and regardless of how far in the future it still may be, you can absolutely be sure of one thing. He, had, he hadn't come back in this time. He hadn't come back in our time. But listen, Jesus Christ is coming back in his time. He is coming back. Repent. It's a word that's forgotten in a lot of preaching. Yeah. Uh, repent. It's interesting. This word's been forgotten, being that John the Baptist used it regularly. Uh, John the Baptist in those days, it talks about John Cain preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It is at hand. Uh, even Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 4 and 7, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preachers ought to, listen, it ought to be on the lips of us as well. 
Uh, Luke in chapter 24 and verses 46 through 47 says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's why I just don't understand why a preacher will stand up and preach and never mention about the need for repentance. If you don't preach repentance, you're not preaching. And so Peter tells him to repent and be converted. Now, to be converted, to turn, the, this word implies to turn from something and to turn to something. James Montgomery Boyce says it this way, to be converted is better translated, turning to God, or even better, flee to God. Flee to God. Boyce connects this with the imagery of the cities of the refuge in the Old Testament and thinks Peter told them, look, to flee to Jesus as the place of refuge. And so we need to be fleeing from sin. And when we're fleeing from sin, we ain't going any old where. We're fleeing to God. And so that's what converting means. It means to repent, turn, and be converted. Now, so Peter says repent and then turn to God. Now, this biblical message of repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus is all through the scriptures, especially in Acts chapter 20. And these two things always go together. They always go together. Repenting and turning. Now listen, you can't convert yourself. Did you know that? You can't convert yourself. I said in, 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 in Sunday school, listen, being a new creation in Christ isn't turning over, an, uh, it ain't turning over the leaf that you are, just turning over a new, no, it's becoming a whole new leaf. You're a new creation. And so, so you can't convert yourself. Uh, you can only be converted. Now that's an act of God. Only God can convert. Both repentance and faith make up the total, which is conversion. Here's, here's, here's how one preacher said it. Repentance is feeling sorry enough to quit. Yeah, that's good right there. Repentance is feeling sorry enough to quit. Quit means turning to Jesus. You quit what you're doing, and you don't just stop that. You turn to the one who will allow you to keep on quitting what you've been doing. Are y'all with me? And so that's what repentance is. Here's how Charles Spurgeon says it. Repentance is a discovery of the evil of sin, mourning that we have committed it. A resolution to forsake it. It is, in fact, a change of mind of a very deep and practical character which makes the man love what once he hated and hate what he once loved. That's repentance. And so if translated means turning around, turning from, and turning to, a turning from sin, a turning to holiness, a turning from carelessness, and to fault from the world to heaven and to Jesus, that's a complete turnaround. And so uh, the word here says repent and be converted. Why? That your sins may be blotted out. And what is that talking about? It means to wipe or to wash away. It gives the idea of a clean slate. Did y'all know in ancient writing, ancient writing wasn't like we write today. In ancient writing, it uh, was on a papyrus and the ink had no acid. So it didn't bite into the papyrus. So it just sort of sat on the top of it. So if you made a mistake, you know what you could do? You could wet a sponge and wipe it away and it'd be gone and you'd rewrite it. See, we try that today. Ink just smeared the page. You got to ball up the piece of paper and throw it away. That's what he's talking about. You'd wipe it away. It'd be all, it'd be gone. You could start over. That's how the Lord does. He blots out your sin when you repent, wipes it away. The Bible says it's gone as far as the east from the west. I don't know about y'all, but that's a long way. And so it says he'll wipe it away. Colossians chapter 2 and verses 13 and 14 says it this way. And you being dead in your trespasses. And can I tell you, uh, before we knew the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were all dead in our sin and trespasses. It says, and being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against you, which was contrary to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross he's wiped it away this is a certificate of death listen there's a certificate of death with in its requirements something written with the hand used to refer to a certificate of indebtedness handwritten by the debtor and acknowledging of his debt and all people owe a debt because they violated his law and so a note handwritten basically is an IOU 
And Barclay, William Barclay says it like this, a self-confessed indictment, a charge list which they themselves had signed and admitted was accurate. And so having wiped out the handwriting, blotted out, canceled, to rub off, to erase, reminds me of David's request in Psalm 51 in verse 9. It talks about taking it out. It's perfect indicative, emphasizes removal that is permanent. How many of us in here are thankful to God that the sins that we've committed because we've repented, trusted in, the, in, in, in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we don't have to worry about those sins anymore, that they're permanently removed? See, Peter here is talking about natural repentance. He's talking to the nation there of Israel, the Jewish people. Depends on per, listen, national repentance depends on personal repentance. The response of individual sinners to, to the message of salvation. Peter was addressing a large crowd, but he still made the application personal. Can I tell you in our 21st century times, oh, how America needs to repent. We need to repent deeply because we are continuing to move further and further away from the Lord Jesus. Oh, many other nations need to repent too and be converted. And that'll happen one by one. And so there's a repentance here. The second thing we see is the refreshing. This is the good news of repentance. So time, look, so that times of refreshing may come. Now, forgiveness is what people need. And the only place anyone will ever find forgiveness is in Christ. And so only God can forgive sin. Did you know that? Only God can truly forgive it in a way that it's removed permanently forever. Repentance will not only bring the individual blessing of forgiveness, but ultimately collective blessing also. God does not wipe away sins without adding His refreshment to our spirits if we turn to Him. So the word translated refreshing refers to restoration of strength and nourishment. And did y'all know strength is restored when hope is restored? See, we was all in a hopeless situation, but God stepped out of heaven, stepped out of the throne room with all his glory and come to this earth to do what? To save that which was lost. And that was all of us. We were all in a hopeless situation. But man, when he come on the scene, hope come on the scene. And only he can forgive and provide the refreshment to our soul. This phrase, times of refreshing, speaking of a future kingdom. See, for generations, Israel had waited anxiously for that kingdom. They longed to see the Messiah reign personally. Tragically, though, when the king came, they rejected him. And as Peter points out, it's impossible to have the kingdom without the king. That's a good word. It's impossible to have the kingdom, to experience the kingdom without accepting the king. Times refers to a fixed, set, predetermined time. Uh, Ezekiel talks about this in Ezekiel 34. I will make them and the places all around my hill of blessing, and I will cause showers to come down in their season, that there shall be showers of blessings. The Bible says that there's a future kingdom coming. There's a future kingdom coming in the future. Now, Isaiah talks about it as well in chapter 44 in verse 3. I will pour out, look, for I will pour water on him who is thirsty and floods on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. See, the time will be one that encompasses Israel's repentance. It's a fixed, set, predetermined time. It's very important. Here's how John MacArthur states it. It's interesting, isn't it, that God has predetermined the time, and yet it depends on Israel's repentance. That the, that's the paradox between sovereignty and human will that you will find everywhere in the Scripture. A future remnant of Jews will inherit God's promised blessings, and God will fulfill His covenant with His people, the Jewish nation. Can I tell you, God's not done with Israel yet. He's not and so there'll be a time of refreshing when the nation of Israel comes back to the Lord and repents. Now, the national principle is clear. No repentance, no refreshing. Early Christians looked with expectation to the second coming of Jesus and the restoration of all things that accompanies the establishment of his earthly kingdom. Did you know the Lord is going to rapture the church one day? He's going to call us home. And then after that, sometime after that, we don't know. He's coming back and he's going to restore all things. And so there's a day 
coming. See, the Bible teaches that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Oh, how things would be different today if the, if the earth was filled with the knowledge and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This earth would be a different place. People on this earth would be different people. And when that comes, and look, and the Bible teaches from the city of Jerusalem, Christ will sit one day. Did you know he's going to sit one day and he's going to rule there and there will be perfect peace. You know how I know? Because the Bible tells me so. Listen to how Isaiah describes it over in Isaiah chapter 11. Listen, this is good. The wolf, look, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. I don't know about you, but that ain't happening today. But there's going to be a day that they'll lay down together, the lion and the lamb, the wolf and everything. Going to lay down right there. You ain't got to worry about getting eat, attacked or anything. It's going to be that day. Listen to how it goes on. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Wow. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. I ain't seen a lion eat much straw, but there's going to come a day when he's eating just like the ox. It's amazing. The, listen, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Y'all ever read that? Pick up your Bibles. There's some good stuff in it. Uh, the young nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. And the wean child shall put his hand in the viper's den. This is perfect peace, folks. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters covers the seas. That's everything. And listen, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place shall be glorious. See, by the way, this isn't just for the Jews. Listen, church family. The Bible says in Romans that God grafted us in the branch, listen, into the vine and the tree. Oh, Oh, what a promise it is to us as well. See, with repentance, there's a refreshing. That there's a restoration that we can't even imagine. And one day, the nation of Israel and all people that have repented will enjoy this refreshing. And it only comes from God. There's a repentance. And there's a refreshing, but there is a reminder. There's a reminder to all this. Look with me in verses 21 and 26. It says, Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken. Goes on to say, it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed. See, that prophet's with a P, speaking of Jesus, and every person who will not hear him, who will not accept him, will be destroyed. Yes, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many have spoken and foretold of these days. And it goes on to tell Jesus Christ and his promise from the Lord how he will restore. You know... Interesting, you need to underline that word, those, that phrase, which God has spoken. Who spoke? God did. And when God speaks, that settles it. Now, the mouth of all his holy prophets. You want to know how the Bible was written? God said it through the mouth of his prophets. Every single word of this scripture is inspired by God. It's not some theological speculation. When I pick up my Bible and read every word of it, every word is designed to be exactly where it's designed to be, and it says what it needs to say. By the way, did you know, uh, and just for the record, 3,808 3, times in the Bible it says, and God said, or the word of God came, or something. December 3,808 times God made sure we knew who was speaking he's speaking and when he speaks it settles it I'm telling you I don't care who says it if it contradicts the word of God I ain't listening you say preacher that sounds a little narrow minded well let me tell you folks in order to hit the narrow way we're going to have to be narrow minded y'all understand what I'm saying it says the gate's narrow and it is exclusive Jesus Christ is the only way the only way. And so it, next time that you, somebody says, well, you know, you seem to be a little narrow-minded, just remind them, yep, because I'm headed toward the narrow gate. <laughs> See, in order to drive home the point to the prophet, listen, that the prophet spoke of the Messiah's first coming, Peter uses the example of Moses. Interesting. 
He'd use somebody that they were familiar with, that they looked up to, who not only prophesied the Messiah's coming, but also warned Israel that uh, what would happen if they rejected him. You say, and he's used Moses and he speaks about Moses and he talks about Moses. But listen, if you don't listen to Moses, how about the first Christian martyr named Stephen? And in, in Acts 7, he says, this is that Moses. You've seen him. This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me and your, uh, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Moses had some similarities with Christ. Did you know that? He's a type of Christ, sp- uh, s- symbolically speaking. He, here's how John MacArthur talks about it in his commentary. Moses was a type of Christ, a foreshadow. He was spared death as a baby. Who else was spared death as a baby? Jesus Christ. He renounced the royal court. He had compassion on his people. He made intercession for his people. He spoke with God face to face, and he was the mediator of a covenant. And he says, Moses told you. And then he goes on to say uh, in Deuteronomy, he talks, he uses this, this phrase. This comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him shall you hear. He goes on to say in verse 18 of that same chapter of 18 in Deuteronomy, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I have commanded him. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks my name, I will require it of them. Require what? And well, in Acts 23 tells them that they shall utterly be destroyed. Everybody's going to have an opportunity to hear from Jesus. The Bible tells us there'll be none with excuse. Peter reminds them that every prophet from Samuel to John the Baptist has taught the same thing. In short order, Peter's saying that they are without excuse. So there's a reminder. Reminder of them to who they are. They're the sons of the prophets. They ought to know. They should have known. But they didn't. They didn't know. In verse 25, it says that God made a promise to Abram about these days, Abraham. Romans 15 and 8 says, now that, I, now that Jesus Christ has become a servant to the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the Father. It's a promise. The Lord promised his chosen people, but he didn't stop with them. When you look at that verse there, it says, and your seed. And in your seed, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Seed in plural. Singular. Speaking of Jesus, he's the only one that can provide the restoration and the refreshing to both the Jew and the Gentile. And it's only through faith in him. You know, the Lord promises all of us the blessing of being saved. It's restoration, forgiveness, and refreshing. He's the only way. He made that declaration in John 14. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You know, I was reading in history. I love history. You know, we ain't had much snow or anything like that this year. Uh, Maybe next year we'll get a blizzard, I'm hoping. But anyway. (laughs) But many of y'all probably have heard throughout history there was a hurricane about 120 some years ago. Actually about 122, I believe. Down in Galveston. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Of historic proportion. A hurricane there. 6,000 people were killed. But they had ample warning to leave. Even in that day, they might not have had all the Doppler radars and all that stuff, but someone had spotted the hurricane offshore before it came inland and, and, and had told them, there's a hurricane coming. And see, there's a concrete wall there today that stands as a barrier against that such a disaster happening, hopefully, again. It's also a reminder that uh, 120 some years ago, thousands of people heard a message and chose not to respond. This morning, some of you have heard a message. You've heard a message of repentance. You've heard a message of restoration and refreshing. And you've had a reminder. Will you respond?
Well, thank you for tuning in and listening to this online message from Living Water Baptist Church. We hope you've been encouraged and challenged. We at Living Water believe that every time God's word is preached, it demands a response. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 24, that everyone who hears his words and does them will be like a person who built their house on a solid foundation. So if there's a decision you know of that you need to make in response to this message, would you let us know by emailing us at decision at lwbctriad.org? Whether it's the need to repent of your sins and trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you need to follow through on your salvation and be baptized, or you want to join our faith family here at Living Water through church membership, or you simply need us to pray for you. Whatever the need, we want to hear from you. So please email us at decision at lwbctriad.org so that we can better minister to you. For more information about Living Water Baptist Church, be sure to visit us online. You can check out our website at www.lwbctriad.org or you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash lwbctriad. Well, God bless you. Thanks again for joining us online and we hope to see you in person this coming Sunday.